Our New Testament reading this morning is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues to Damascus, so that he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but not but seeing no one. Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he could, not, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to thy saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call upon thy name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and took food and was strengthened. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and in the synagogues immediately he proclaimed Jesus, saying, He is the Son of God. The Gospel reading today is from John chapter 21, which is the very last chapter, and it's also from 1 to 19, so we're leaving one verse, because that's the way it is. <laughs> Still don't have it, I have X. There's such a fine line between Acts and John. There it is. <coughs> After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the son of Zebedee, two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boats, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you any fish? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in 
for the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. They're talking, John said to Peter. It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his clothes. He was dressed just in a loincloth. He put on his clothes, for he was stripped for work, and sprang into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. And when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish lying on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked where you, you would, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go. This he said to show by what death he was to glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. This is Cinco de Mayo. Doesn't mean very much to most of us, but I'd like to call your attention to the refugees at our southern border. If you can pray for them, if you can do something in addition to that, that you're called to make a humane act of love through Christ, do it. That's how we recognize Cinco de Mayo. We are a community of light and life, and we face a hostile world. How evident in that border treatment. The disciples and we act like it's over. Now what? We can't do anything. It happens that when in doubt, when confused, when disappointed, can you think of what we do? Eat. We always eat. That's that wrong. I mean, you see that Jesus was there ready to meet those doubtful, tired um, people that were just doing their job. Well, now it might be pizza. But when confused, when disappointed, and thinking what to do, we gather at a pizza place or order in or something. Then it was fish. Fish in the morning, fish it in the afternoon, and fish in the evening. It was, a, it was abundant. And it was business as usual. I guess that's their job to go fishing. Peter and the boys went out fishing, and that's what they knew. That was their job before Jesus recruited them. 
they were a bit glum, but they went out at night like they always did and caught nothing. I bet you heard the grumbling before they got to the shore. It was just sad. Jesus from the shore advised them to go out again, but this time throw their nets on the other side of the boat. And they go, you got to be kidding. Um, I guess we can do it. I don't know who this guy is, but he sounds pretty sure. So tired and doubtful, they tried again. And what do you know? It's the mother load. As the dawn began to break, so did their light, and they registered that it was Jesus who had prepared a fire on the, on the shore to cook and eat those fish, the fish that became a symbol of Jesus for the early church and to this day. Theirs was a simple and symbolic um, as a meal that we're going to share with communion. Very simple, bread and fish. We have bread and juice, both abundant and nutritious and coming to the realization that that is the Christ. The disciples had been drifting aimlessly until their hearts and eyes were open to the spiritual power that Jesus represented. The light and heat of the fire became the fire and light of their eyes and hearts. This account made it quite clear that the resurrection was real, and Jesus is not a vision or a hallucination. He's real. Can we touch him? We couldn't before, but maybe we can now. The ideas started flowing into their heads. They were no longer blank and wondering what to do. The disciples were empowered to be a community of faith again and with a strong spiritual presence wherever they went. There were a variety of responses to the rest of Jesus. As we heard this morning, Peter had denied Christ three times. Since Jesus knew and we know our God is forgiving, Peter wiped away that reality of three denials by claiming he loved Jesus three times. Are you prepared to give, your, give up your steady job and the reasonable comforts in order to give yourself forever to God, to God's people, to God's work? That's what he's calling us to do, give up everything and follow. I think I would negotiate with God if it was came to that, I would say, well, maybe if I just do this. I did do that, but I'll tell you later. Peter was feeling that way too. What he thought was disillusion was a restart of his ministry. Just because Jesus called him early on and said, I want you to lead my church and my people, he wasn't off the hook. He had to start doing it, in spite of all the things that had gone before. He was commissioned to be the leader, the head of the church. Now, you may think that most ministers and archbishops and whoever else is uh, ordained into ministry knows everything and is the last word, but they're the, only the guides to what you as a community do. You have a pastor coming that's going to stir up the mixture and he's going to make things happen. And you're not going to like it, but you're going to trust him because this is what interims do. This is what leaders do. <laughs> they start to, to mix up things like you've got a, a very good system. Everybody works together. But maybe that's not the way he sees it. Maybe he sees that you need to shake it up a little. So just pray about that and be prepared. Uh, and according to John, Peter was the great shepherd of Christ's people. He was a great shepherd. And if anybody had to follow Jesus, who was the good shepherd, 
I think that's pretty good. He left somebody great in charge. He, and Peter died on the cross, but upside down. He did that because he claimed he was not at all equal with Jesus. He saw him as much, much more. And none of us are. Jesus was a gentle, thoughtful, strong leader who didn't fear the authorities that opposed him because he knew what the outcome was to be, what the benefit of his suffering was to be. He knew his purpose and direction and where he was going, and now the disciples did as well, or they thought. Now in Acts, we hear the story of Saul's conversion. It must have been really, really tough to take a man who was so sure that he was right in getting rid of all Christians that he killed them. And then right on the road to Damascus where most of the people lived that were going to travel all over the world, he was stopped in his tracks. A zealot stopped in his tracks. He didn't want the people to spread the news far and wide. He had detailed plans as he entered Damascus. And there he was brought to his knees and blinded by Jesus, asking him, what are you doing, Saul? He then was led to Ananias, who questioned working with this zealot. Nevertheless, Ananias, being a follower, welcomed, educated, converted, and swore in Paul to a new purpose. Did you notice his name changed? It changed because he changed. Paul's eyes were open to the reality of what Jesus wanted him to do. And throughout his mission, he bore the guilt of what he had done before he followed Jesus. To this day, there are Jews for Jesus. There's KKK members that have had their eyes opened and turned around to follow Jesus. And I'm sure there are others. I'm sure there are some people here that have questioned, why do we adhere to these tenets that everything is around Jesus and what he said and did? How can I adhere to these? And that's right. This is where you come with those questions and confusions. You can't teach resurrection. You can only believe in it. We are often busily going about life without purpose or with the purpose of earning lots of money and being successful. But our hearts are longing for someone or something to enlighten us. God is patient and forgiving, loving and compassionate. We know that. And thank God, because we wouldn't be here if we didn't have forgiveness and compassion and forgiveness and all those things that say, try again. We want to be in charge. We're human. But church is where we learn. We learn how to give it up for Jesus. There's a couple college students that I met when I was taking a class at Central. And they said, I love Jesus. I just love him for everything, and I'll do anything to make that known. And I go, wow, I, I can't remember when I thought that. I just remember thinking, Jesus suffered so much, and he asked me to do the same thing. But I followed, because who could replace him? Who wants to do that? Jesus did. We learned to take it home and process the information and practices that we do here throughout the week. Ask anyone who has given their heart to Christ, and they will exhale. Oh. 
and have a peaceful look on their face. They have been changed. They have been freed and reminded of their purpose. Basically, it's, are you Saul or Paul? Are you Peter or John? Love is not an emotion. Emotional love will not stand the test of time. Love is a responsibility and a sacrifice. It's an act or a will. We do not really love Christ unless we are prepared to face his task and take up his cross. According to a pop, pop song, if we love someone and we're not afraid to lose them, if, no, if, we're, if we love someone and we're afraid to lose them, we open up our hearts. But if we're not afraid to lose them, then we probably never love them at all. Peter might be shepherd of Christ. Paul might be the pioneer of Christ. But John was the witness to Christ. Their job was to follow Jesus and to attest to these things that they know are true. You don't have to know everything in the Bible. You don't have to spout the things that say you are knowledgeable and Christ has taken you over. You just have to say what happened to you to make you adhere to the things of Christ and to be his follower. That's our call. I told you there'd be a story about something that's more personal. That's my story. And it's only a small segment of that story because the story goes on and on throughout my life. I spent my, about half of my life wondering and wandering, unaware of what my purpose was. And I'd quite ask it uh, off and on, saying, so why am I here? When I was just 31, I was told I have cataracts and I would need to go to U of M for a second opinion. Now we have cataracts and go and outpatient and remove them and go on our way and get glasses or implants or whatever. But this was in 1976. My doctor made an appointment for me and in December I went down to U of M to get the easy answer. You need glasses, we can do this. I was admitted for a week-long stay. I was put in the Mott Wing, which is the one where they don't know what's wrong with you. I settled into my room, and it wasn't long before I heard, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? I look around and I don't know where that came from. And I've been going to church all my life, so I don't know why I didn't think it was God. But how many people think it's God when you hear a voice? Even though I had attended church most of that time, I did not see the identity that was of that verse. So I asked everyone who came into the room, whether they were cleaning or delivering magazines or whatever, no one knew. And after asking everyone, later that evening, a man from another part of that hospital called me on my phone next to my bed. Now, if you imagine, he knows where my room is and my telephone number, and I don't know him. And he said, are you the lady looking for the verse? And I said, yes. And he said, it's Psalm 27. I felt the Holy Spirit go through me just in ripples all the way from my head to my toes. And somehow, the scales fell from my eyes through surgeries. And my life purpose was established. I was called to ministry. Now my question is, why... Why did that verse say to me, I'm called to ministry? I wasn't trying to look for a ministry job. I wasn't thinking I was a great leader. 
but six months later, I gave my life to Christ in the Invitational during worship. And I was launched. No, no, no. Remember that negotiation stuff? Seven years of, of humanness moved in, and I negotiated and stalled and tried to get God to agree on something less foreboding. I finally said yes, and it was as if I was on the end of Crack the Whip. I was off to grad school with a matching grant, and the first class that I sat in was the one about Jesus. And this was a Catholic school that I went to because I didn't know what a Jesuit was. The nuns came to me during the break and said, are you all right? Well, I guess I had turned paler than I am because it was such a, a shock to me to know that Jesus was this person that I understood to be way off, and he was right here. I finally said yes, and I was off to grad school, but then I graduated from grad school, and in the commissioning, my roommate, who was a very good singer, sang, bless this name, Jean Winther, wake unto the Lord, you holy one. Let no more your blessings be unsung. Let all people see the Christ in you. Alleluia. And it was as if it was coming from the rafters of the big cathedral. Some have seen an aura. Others have seen peace. Yet some have thought there was something wrong with me. I say it's Jesus the love and strength of my life. I once was lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. Amen. <laughs>